Hello and good morning and welcome to this webinar on mortgages and LPA receivers and some important issues that have arisen from a number of developments in the recent case law. Now, I'm David Sortel, I'm a barrister at 39 Essex Chambers and I specialise in property disputes and in construction and development uh, disputes. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not joined this morning by uh, Niraj. Uh, he has been called into an emergency hearing uh, this morning. But as with the uh, best practices at the bar, I've fully prepared both sides of brief and I shall be taking over his part while trying to maintain uh, the flavour that uh, Niraj is going to bring to some of the most important developments in this field. So what we'll be looking at today, uh, first of all, we're looking at an overview of the remedies of a mortgagee, particularly now uh, with the implementation of the government's emergency legislation and amendments to the civil procedure rules, the mortgagee uh, might well be looking at different remedies to enforce uh, any security they, they might have, as opposed to simply a claim for possession, particularly in respect of residential premises. So the first part of the webinar we should be looking at uh, alternative remedies that a mortgagee might have. We'll then go on to consider decision making by the mortgagee, and in particular the UBS against Rose Capital Ventures Limited, and to see uh, if there have been any recent developments uh, in the uh, decision making process that a mortgagee has to demonstrate when choosing uh, to enforce its security. Uh, one problem that has been uh, concerning the courts recently is land registration and the registration gap. And Scale with Leisure Limited against Armstrong uh, shows and demonstrates a particular aspect of that uh, when a legal charge was created and was registered uh, but was then uh, assigned and the mortgagee or the intended mortgagee then attempted to enforce its security without being registered as the proprietor of that legal charge. And in that case, uh, the High Court had to look at whether or not it could indeed exercise a power of sale on either under Section 101 or Section 106 of Law Property Act. Finally, we'll look at the duties owed by LPA receivers in a recent case of Devon Commercial Property Limited against Barnett. And in particular, looking at uh, whether on the conflict of interest that LPA receivers have uh, as not only agents of a mortgagor, but as being appointed by the uh, mortgagee. And in respect of that case, uh, whether or not they could uh, sell a property to an associated company of the mortgagee. So let's turn to the first part of the webinar and looking at the mortgagee's uh, remedies. And there are five principal ones which are available to the legal mortgagee. Uh, just want to make that distinction first of all. There is a difference between a legal mortgagee and an equitable uh, mortgagee. And a legal mortgagee is uh, registered and the uh, um, mortgage is registered against the estate. Uh, and secondly, uh, they've gone through all the necessary formalities of executing a uh, legal mortgage. It'll be executed by deed and it will be registered. Uh, first of all, they can simply bring uh, a Part 7 claim in debt, not simply a claim on the security, but under the personal covenant uh, to repay. Uh, that's probably one we're spending the least time on, uh, together with potential action for foreclosure. Uh, foreclosure is a, a very much a remedy of last resort, and it results in the equity of redemption uh, of a mortgage or simply collapsing. So foreclosure is also very rarely encountered these days, particularly given uh, the other powers uh, which are open. Sale is probably one of the most important ones. Uh, given the power of a mortgagee to simply sell the security and to therefore recover uh, from the proceeds of sale, uh, the costs incurred in the sale, and then also the uh, loan which has been secured uh, against that security. Uh, possession is often used as antecedent to a sale. Often it's easier to sell with vacant possession. But as we'll go on to see, particularly in respect of residential premises at the moment, it isn't so necessarily so easy uh, if, for example, it's a receiver uh, attempting to get possession. 
And then finally, coming on to the appointment of a receiver. And this is probably something that uh, more and more mortgagees are considering at this moment in time, as uh, debts are not being paid or installments under a charge are simply not being paid. Uh, and rather than having to go through a procedure of possession or sale, uh, they are simply looking to the appointment of a receiver, either to put pressure uh, on the debtor uh, or to see if they can recover the uh, loan demand. We will be considering, to a certain extent, the equitable mortgages or equitable charges remedies, uh, but these are uh, more difficult and uh, we'll be going through those, particularly in, in light of the Scalworth case. There are other uh, more esoteric remedies, for example, but often under a deed is, a, is a appropriate or possible to appoint an administrator or administrative receiver, and that course of action is also open to holders of certain debentures. Uh, that is uh, outside the scope of the webinar and often you'd be looking uh, towards uh, the uh, appointing deed uh, in respect of those powers. Um, Moving on uh, then to consider uh, the action in a debt claim. And it's unusual to see the debt claim being the first claim in mortgagee uh, once when a mortgagor uh, is in default. It's more appropriate and it's more often used uh, when the mortgagee wants to bring an action uh, and wants to recover against any assets which are not secured. Uh, by uh, the security, do not form part of the security. Uh, it might be because they might be the second or third charge in priority and they consider that if the security was sold, it might go through all the effort, uh, but have none of the rewards at the other end. But alternatively, a debt claim can be important if the security is sold and there's any shortfall following the exhaustion of any other remedies. It can also be significant if there's a defect uh, with the security instrument or if there are concerns as to whether or not the uh, loan is in fact uh, secured by the security instrument. So this is an important and valuable fallback uh, remedy. Uh, it's a familiar process, so I don't intend to spend uh, any time uh, further on this. Uh, foreclosure uh, is uh, something to keep in the back pocket and indeed uh, it, it is something you might feel particularly right now is very difficult uh, not least because it requires a court order and it is a court managed process and it gives a court because of its draconian implications uh, for the mortgage or it gives the court uh, a wide uh, discretion to reopen a foreclosure order you might very well think that it's something uh, that is left to last uh, rather than being at the forefront of the mortgagee when considering uh, any potential action. So we're going to be looking in particular at the other remedies and first of all sale. And uh, often it is the most obvious remedy because it can be exercised without having to get uh, possession and the power of sale is contained in section 101 of the law of property act of 1925 but almost always now in any properly drafted instrument there's an express power to sell and often the charge document will set out more extensive powers uh, than are contained in section 101 of the law of property act for section 101 to be engaged uh, first of all it has to be a mortgage by deed and there might have been, for example, difficulties with the execution of the deed. So you may have to simply rely on it as a simple contract, in which case Section 101 may not be uh, available to you. Secondly, the mortgage money uh, has to be due. And uh, that can be uh, an issue, uh, unless, of course, the deed itself or the instrument itself uh, simply gives a, a more wide power to exercise a power cell without the uh, need for money to be due. Um, it's also in section 103 uh, there are further uh, issues which are raised. You need to give a notice requiring payment uh, if mortgage or is still in default or some payments uh, three months later uh, only then does power cell uh, arise or there could be some other breach uh, of a mortgage 
or could be at least two months in arrears of interest uh, under the mortgage. Just like to note that section 105 contains a payment waterfall provision. First of all, proceeds of sale, the use discharge prior encumbrances, the use then to pay the mortgagee's costs and expenses of sale, then to discharge sums due under mortgage plus interest and costs, and then the balance is paid over to the person entitled to the mortgage property. Simply going through that list uh, gives an idea uh, but of course, even if the equity of redemption is valued at a certain amount, it still might not be enough to allow for the entire loaned amount, the entire amount of money secured under the mortgage uh, to be discharged, bring us back to, to uh, the importance of that personal debt claim. The advantage of a power of sale is that you can sell without a court order and indeed without taking possession and there can be a great deal of value in going down such a procedure for example the premises might indeed be tenanted and could be more valuable uh, rather than less valuable if they're sold with the tenant still in possession uh, rather than having a void period risk however for sale is if there is limited equity in the mortgage property as we've just discussed uh, the mortgagee's uh, own interests in respect of the loan secured uh, come quite some way down the uh, waterfall in section 105. Also note there are limits on sale without possession in the residential context and uh, it's a uh, certainly there's certain limitations uh, if the uh, for the mortgagee if they're attempting to sell uh, a, a a uh, more, more normal kind of residential mortgage. So possession is typically the one that we uh, talk about, especially in the context of uh, residential premises. And fundamental, uh, historically, uh, to the nature of a mortgage. And we see indeed uh, comments such as the fact that a mortgagee may go into possession before the ink is dry uh, on the mortgage. But, of course, there has been a legislative intervention and procedural intervention uh, into that. So it's often worth checking to see if, uh, for example, the relevant pre-action protocol applies, uh, if corpse is issued, in respect to a residential mortgage reason might very well be, applied, uh, be uh, in play. One of the main disadvantages of possession is that it places certain obligations on the mortgagee in possession, and they can indeed uh, be onerous uh, to discharge in either commercial or in residential properties. Uh, it's also noteworthy uh, that there's been a moratorium uh, on such uh, possession claims as well, and you'll see on the slide a new CPR rule 55.29 Posing a further stay until later on in August. And of course, the court has wide powers to adjourn proceedings or to suspend a possession order. So, particularly right now, uh, speaking in uh, the end of June 2020, uh, some of the advantages of obtaining possession pursuant to a mortgage have fallen away. And the mortgagee might be concerned that they will be kept out of their money for even longer than they might otherwise be uh, if there were not uh, emergency legislation or procedures in place uh, due to COVID-19. Which is why uh, parties are now considering more and more the appointment of a receiver. Effectively, the receiver stands in between the mortgagee uh, and the mortgagor and they are appointed under the uh, mortgage instrument uh, to manage the mortgage property, uh, to collect rents or profits from a mortgage land, for the purpose of preserving the asset over which a lender has uh, security. And they will owe a duty both towards the mortgagor and towards the mortgagee. And it does allow the mortgagee to be insulated somewhat uh, from any concerns the mortgagee has over the management uh, of property. 
are often hear terms such as fixed charge receivers and LPA receivers, and the term LPA receiver is often used even if the receiver has been appointed uh, under a mortgage instrument. So uh, I will hesitate to call it colloquialism uh, to call out LPA receivers, that's generally what they are called. And the power to appoint an LPA receiver uh, arises and becomes exercisable at the same time as the statutory power of sale arises and becomes exercisable, and that's under section uh, 101. And when it comes to the appointment of a receiver, it's actually often surprisingly straightforward and simple. And typically a receiver, as we'll go on to discuss, will rely on the mortgagee's uh, solicitor. Uh, they will have their standard forms of agreement, and uh, a, uh, an experienced receiver will generally know a process, will take process uh, relatively quickly. And often the threat of the appointment of a receiver is sufficient to put pressure uh, on the defaulting mortgagor. It might very well have consequences for any other loans that the mortgagor might have. In respect of the duties, however, owed by a receiver, as already noted, they're deemed to be the agent of a mortgage law, and uh, therefore uh, they will have somewhat limited duties towards them. But it was confirmed in Sylvan Properties that these are duties owed in equity, and not duties owed in either contract uh, or in tort. And we'll go on to consider later on in the webinar uh, issues as such as conflict of interest uh, when a receiver is appointed. Uh, but the long and the short of it is that a, a receiver is in a somewhat better position uh, than you might otherwise uh, expect uh, given uh, their uh, unique position. The receiver has uh, a number of advantages which are summarized on this slide and in particular because of the way they stand in between the mortgagee uh, and the uh, mortgagor as we can see the receiver can also bring possession proceedings in their own name against a mortgagor occupying a property now this is an interesting one because it was something that had passed uh, almost sub silentio and there was no reported authority for this until Menon and Pasque and the decision uh, of last year is only reported uh, this year, and it's well worth a read. Uh, essentially, and uh, as Justin Mann confirmed in Menon and Pasque, uh, that uh, either this operated as part of their overall powers, or it was an implied term uh, of their appointment. But uh, the reasoning in that case is uh, not so clear necessarily, um, a judicial basis, is certainly not as clear as the result. And the result is the receiver does have the implied right to bring possession proceedings against the mortgage law. And the proceedings must be in the receiver's name. Uh, in that case, one of the difficulties was it effectively being brought as a claim by the mortgage law, acting by their agent, the receivers, uh, against, the against the mortgage law. They can be appointed. Uh, but uh, saying around the same time as liquidators, uh, it doesn't terminate the receiver's appointment. And that can be uh, particularly in, important, particularly in the cases where there might be insolvency uh, on foot. As I've indicated, uh, rent is a particularly important aspect of the appointment of a uh, receiver. And so they can come in and collect the rent and that in itself will put pressure on the mortgage or Receivers do have a power as well to grant uh, leases, but that needs to be balanced against their duty to uh, the mortgage or their duty to recover best practical price, uh, reasonably obtainable in event of a sale. And we'll look on at a case where that very much came into play. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, UBS and Rose Capital Ventures Limited. Uh, where the issues as to what the mortgagee has to take into account when it enforces its security uh, came into play uh, because of a more recent case law in the uh, Supreme Court, uh, which suggested that when it comes to the exercise of discretion uh, under a contract, uh, then the uh, discretion is not entirely unfettered. And on certain occasions, it is necessary to import uh, public law uh, tests. 
in the event, uh, UBS confirms that uh, that kind of uh, importation doesn't really change how we perceived and have perceived the ability of a mortgagee to make its decisions. In the background then uh, is the concept of our equitable constraints on how a mortgagee may exercise powers arising under a mortgage. And Lord Templeman in Downs View said that the uh, powers must be exercised uh, in good faith and with the purpose of obtaining repayment. So if these powers are being exercised for an improper purpose, that's not being exercised in good faith, uh, such as uh, an illegitimate purpose, uh, nothing to do with obtaining repayment, uh, then simply they haven't exercised their discretion properly. And that was reinforced uh, in the Kokorova case. So Lord Newberger confirmed that in equity a mortgagee has only a limited title, which is available only to secure satisfaction of a debt. Security is enforceable for that purpose and no other. But that does not mean that additional collateral purposes to a proper purpose are fatal to enforcement. Coming into that established understanding of the mortgagee's discretion uh, came uh, steaming in, if I can put it that way, the decision in Braganza and BP Shipping Limited. And it arose out of a tragic accident on the BP ship known as British Unity, uh, which I have put on the slide. The claimant's husband, in that case, died whilst on service working on a ship. Uh, the claimant's death uh, could have led to a uh, service benefit, depending on the cause of death. But the final version of the investigation report uh, was that the cause of death was suicide. Uh, so you can see that the uh, cause of death and the decision as to the cause of death became very important uh, to the parties. Justice Tier held that while the decision to refuse payment uh, was unreasonable, and that's because of the uh, nature of the investigation. He himself was unable to make a finding as to the cause of death. There was a real possibility, uh, but not more likely than not, they had simply fallen overboard. But the evidence was not sufficiently cogent to make a finding of suicide or finding falling overboard on the balance of probabilities. Um, it was common ground between the parties that the opinion formed by the employer uh, had to be reasonable. And in uh, holding against the employer, uh, the court found that they had failed to take into account a relevant factor, also failed to consider cogent evidence was required before a finding of suicide. So the question is, what is reasonable? And that decision was reversed by the Court of Appeal, finding in favour of the employer. And that decision again was reversed by the Supreme Court. And the importance for today is the consideration in the Supreme Court of how a contractual discretion should be exercised. And it gave the Supreme Court the opportunity to consider the extent to which a public law Wednesday test uh, could be imported. So, Baroness Hale, uh, it's important to note that there are a number of uh, speeches in Baganza, but they all essentially agree on the point about contractual discretion. Uh, often the party charged making decisions, uh, those decisions affect the rights of both parties, and there might well be a conflict of interest uh, between the two. Um, Char of a party making a decision, charged with making a decision, uh, effectively has to hold uh, the balance. And it's not for the uh, courts uh, to rewrite the bargain for parties between them. It's not for the courts, certainly, to substitute themselves uh, for the contractually agreed uh, decision maker. But the courts have sought to ensure that such contractual powers are not abused. And that is by way of an implied term as to the manner in which such powers may be exercised. And it's important to note that that term will vary according to the terms of the contract and the context in which the decision making power is given. And Baroness Hell said that there is a parallel between cases where a contract assigns a decision making function and where a statute assigns a decision making function to a public authority. 
she cited the case of Paragon Finance against Nash, where the question was, was there any implied term limiting the power of a mortgagee to set interest rates under a variable rate mortgage? And Lord Justice Dyson uh, went on to consider whether uh, there should also be an implied power that would not be exercised unreasonably. Uh, he said he'd been somewhat reluctant, however, to extend implied term to include unreasonableness that is analogous to Wednesday unreasonableness, but did say the power would not be exercised dishonestly, an improper purpose, capriciously or arbitrarily. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the existing case law before Baganza uh, certainly said it was coming somewhat close to a Wednesday test, but refused to explicitly make the jump. And Hayes and Willoughby, uh, Lord Sumption said a reasonable uh, effectively gave a good definition of reasonableness. First of all, the external objective standard applied to the outcome of a person's thoughts or intention, and also a test of rationality uh, applies a minimum objective standard uh, to the relevant person's mental processes. And Baroness Hell uh, went on to consider uh, that and said, if it's part of a rational decision-making process to, to exclude extraneous circumstances and considerations, it must therefore be right to say that you have to take into account those which are obviously relevant. But the Supreme Court didn't then go on to uh, simply apply good faith uh, wholesale across all commercial contracts and made it clear this will depend on the terms and context of the particular contract. And uh, unless there was an implied term, the outcome was objectively reasonable, uh, such as, for example, a, a reasonable price or some other kind of implied term, the court would be reluctant to go further than to imply a term. A decision-making process was lawful and rational in the public law sense. So really looking at the second limb of law assumptions test. And this was confirmed uh, by the uh, other uh, substantive speeches in the Supreme Court. Lord Hodge uh, confirmed, uh, with whom uh, Lord Kerr agreed, the court is not to substitute its own view of what is a reasonable decision. Instead, it conducts a uh, rationality uh, review. Uh, Lord Newberger uh, gave a uh, further speech, and he cited Soccer International Bank Limited against Standard Bank London Limited, where he cited Lord Justice Ricks, and so a decision-making discretion will be limited by concepts of honesty, uh, good faith, and genuineness. And I note what was said by Wayne Courtney in a uh, resulting uh, case note in the Law Quarterly Review, uh, where he said, the adoption of a full Wednesday test thus stands on a relatively narrow basis. And courts must be cautious in seeking to generalize the reasoning to other contexts. And in particular, uh, I note also in Property Alliance Group against Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, PLC, Court of Appeal accepted the power to obtain a valuation, uh, for example, uh, was not unfettered. Uh, and I quote, however, in that case, it, Royal Bank of Scotland must have been free to act in its own interests. It was no under no duty to attempt to balance its interests against those of Property Alliance Group. Of course, Property Alliance Group will no doubt pay the costs uh, of the valuation exercise uh, in that case. But a Royal Bank of Scotland, under the terms of a mortgage deed, is entitled to simply look at its own interests and not to carry out uh, the kind of holding of the scales uh, might be considered to be appropriate if we were to apply a Braganza implied term uh, on a completely full throttle and full basis. And so we, in Property Alliance Group and Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, we see the Court of Appeal reaffirming the idea of the legitimate exercise of a power rather than simply using that power to say vex uh, the mortgage or uh, maliciously. And the test of being unable to commission evaluation for purpose unrelated to legitimate commercial interests or of doing so could not rationally be thought to advance them. And I struggled to see the difference between this kind of test and one in Downtew and Kukurova uh, that we saw before the decision in Baganza.
So UBS and Raise Capital Ventures, then, uh, which is the main topic for this part of the webinar, uh, saw an attempt to try and get that kind of implied term. And the first time the courts have really been asked to consider, that does began to change the way in which we perceive and that the mortgagee should be exercising or considering the exercise of its powers uh, under a mortgage instrument. So we have Rose Capital. They borrow uh, just over £20 million uh, from UBS. Quite classic terms, five years, subject to a right to require repayment of full on three months' notice. And before a five-year term had expired, UBS gave their three months' notice, sought repayment, uh, appointed receivers, and after the expiry of the term, they demanded repayment and sought possession. And this is the uh, defence that was used in that case. It was argued as one line of defence, discretion to call him a loan early was subject to a duty of good faith, not to be exercised in a manner that was irrational, arbitrary, capricious and or unreasonable, but in particular uh, should be applied along what I might call a full Baganza line. Uh, UBS applied to strike out that part of the defence. They accepted they were subject to a duty of good faith, but they submitted it was on the narrow scope and what I might call more traditional uh, Downs View and Kokoroba scope, and that uh, it was entitled to put its own interests ahead of those of the borrower. The defendant uh, raised the uh, somewhat adventurous uh, argument that this mortgage contract was instead a relational contract and that the duty of good faith was to be implied, including a duty of cooperation and communication. And the matter came before Chief Master Marsh, who cited uh, Kukurova and said that additional purposes to a proper purpose did not vitiate enforcement uh, of the security. And said it follows in the absence of an allegation that UES's decision to call in the loan was disconnected from a desire to obtain repayment of the loan and to enforce the security. This duty of good faith will not avail the defendants. UBS was not required to have, quote, unquote, purity of purpose. Did consider head on the argument based on Baganza, but noted the legal principles approved and applied were well established. And as you've seen, Baganza itself uh, referred to some of the important uh, cases involving mortgagees and mortgagors. And what Chief Master Marsh uh, set out uh, thereafter, I think is worthy of note. First of all, it's not every contractual power or discretion that will be subject to a Baganza uh, limitation. Uh, you could say that the decision in Baganza is quite a broad textured one, and you could even argue uh, what is a Baganza limitation given the importance of context. But I think what we're saying here is it's certainly not going to apply a full notion of uh, good faith duties such as the defendants were trying to set out to establish. Type of contractual decisions that are amenable to a Baganza term or decisions to affect the rights of both parties of contract where the decision maker um, has a clear uh, conflict of interest. And that can be contrasted to a unilateral right given to one party to act in a particular way. It's a right to terminate a contract uh, without cause. And we've seen, for example, in the Cottonex and Stork case, uh, courts have been very reluctant indeed to try to import notions of good faith. The nature of a contractual relationship, including the balance of power between the parties, is a factor to be taken uh, into account. And just pausing and coming back to Braganza, one of the main issues uh, for substantial debate uh, between the speeches in the Supreme Court uh, was the effect on contracts of employment. Well, that is likely to be a far more relational relationship than a contract such as a, a mortgage. Well, of course, the mortgages will always be uh, at, in conflict to those of a mortgage or so the scope of the term implies will vary according to the circumstances and terms of the contract well that of course did not avail the defendants at all because the language of contractual terms could not be more stark and subject to the Cookerover and Downs view limitations we previously discussed 
uh, the lender was given that power to call in the loan immediately. So there was no room in this contract for a Baganza term. In any case, mortgage lending has its own protection in the forms of a duty of good faith. And which probably led Chief Master Marsh on uh, into paragraph 57 to saying, well, if there was a term, then how are you actually going to write the term? This is something often that if we are to imply a term, what is the actual scope of a term? How would you actually draft such an implied term? Often where some defences or claims fall down. And if it was to be drafted, then it's one which does look very much like our traditional understanding of how a mortgagee exercises its power. So I think the moral of the story is uh, that uh, we should not see um, more uh, recent developments of contractual discretion as riding and coaching horses through long established and well established equitable principles of those that also include a duty of good faith. I'd like to come on to the uh, interesting case of Skelwith and the problem of land registration. This becomes quite topical uh, when you have a situation such as now, uh, but not always. Uh, occasionally, uh, we land registry will have issues with delay. We're having issues of delay now uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 uh, restrictions. But every now and again, the land registry does slow down and issues as to the registration gap uh, suddenly arise, become more important. And the issue in this case uh, can be summarized uh, fairly simply. You have a legal charge, it's properly registered. Uh, it's then assigned uh, to uh, another party, but that other party then seeks to try and rely on the mortgagee's remedies before registration. Can it do so? What does Skelwith say? Looking at the facts, all about a golf club, uh, an agreement by um, a uh, by Flaxby Partnership with Mr. Armstrong and the lead to sell the club to Skelwith Leisure Limited. It's going to be a price of seven million pounds, but we're going to hold back the last part of price, just north of three point five million pounds, and that last deferred consideration is going to be secured by a charge, and Mr. Armstrong is going to be registered as the charge holder. That all goes ahead. He is registered. Mr. Armstrong alleges, however, that Scalworth have not paid, failed to fulfill, fulfill some other obligations. He then assigns the charge, uh, or assigns the benefit of the charge anyway, uh, to uh, a company called Polar and executes a transfer of the charge to Polar, but Polar is not registered as the holder of the charge at the land registry. Mr. Armstrong then purports to give. Uh, to scale with notice of the assignment uh, of the charge to Polar. And before registration, Polar purports to exercise a power of sale uh, to a new company, Flaxby Park Limited, for four million pounds. And this is going to be the issue. Can Polar exercise the power of sale? So lots of cross applications for strike out and summary judgment, all turning on this legal point. Are they able to sell? And the decision is an interesting one because although reflexively we think we arrive at the right result, it does demonstrate some issues as to equitable charges because this is no doubt what it was. It was an equitable charge because it couldn't possibly be a legal charge because it hadn't been registered under the Land Administration Act uh, 2002. Um, So, first of all, section 24. Section 24 says a person who is entitled to be registered can exercise the powers of the owner, but Mr. Justice uh, knew he wasn't going down that path and said that section 24 did not avail the uh, owner of an equitable charge. It simply wasn't there. Had to actually be uh, for mortgagee. So they couldn't 
simply rely on section 24 and they couldn't rely on a power of attorney. Uh, reason for that is because there'd been simply nothing there to say that uh, Polo was selling the club and, and there were, that uh, FPL was attorney. Um, but, so section 101 wasn't going to work, but it was all going to turn on the wording of section 106. Section 106 is about the power to exercise power of sale, and it reads like this. The power of sale conferred by this act may be exercised by any person for the time being entitled to receive and give a discharge for the mortgage money. So we have a situation where the equitable assignee can't rely on the power under section 101, but it because it is capable of giving a discharge for mortgage money, and it, it can therefore exercise a power of sale. And it might very well be felt that this result, that the equitable assignee, allowing uh, Polo to succeed by the skin of its teeth, as Niraj points out, uh, sits uncomfortable, uncomfortably with land lawyers, particularly because of the case of uh, Swift First Limited. Now, that was a case where uh, a charge had been granted uh, by deed, but it hadn't been registered at all, never been registered. And it was held in that case uh, that they were still entitled to exercise a power of sale under section 101. So on how section 101 is to be interpreted, there's a fundamental clash, one might feel, between Swift and, uh, and uh, Scalewith. And the difference lies in this, in that in Swift, the mortgage had never been registered at all, it never become a legal charge. Uh, whereas in Scalewith, it had been registered, it had become a legal charge, and we are looking at the disposition of uh, an illegal interest in land. So there is a difference, and uh, Niraj and I arrive, arrive at different conclusions about this case, and he says it's a little unsatisfactory um, why it depends on the type of equitable mortgage. Uh, I say because of the importance of land registration and the importance of the register, but from a practice point of view, it might be seen as being um, unsatisfactory that we have to look into the history of an equitable charge. And I think this gives a problem to trying to rely on equitable charges. We are simply uh, in a more complicated legal and factual matrix than simply relying on a legal charge, which gives you more clearly the powers you might wish to rely upon. Uh, I uh, inserted slightly a footnote at the bottom of Niraj's slide, and that's an article by Dr. Emma Lees writing in the conveyancer. And uh, she agrees that it's the right answer, but it's not without its difficulties. Again, the point out a distinction lies between there's a failed transfer of an existing legal mortgage in cases where there's a failed creation of a legal mortgage. So where there is a failed transfer, uh, the question is not whether the right exists, the right does exist. But the question is who can exercise uh, the rights uh, under that legal charge. And I think that probably is uh, the right answer. Uh, the moral of the story, however, might well be to, number one, get your registration sorted out, or number two, if you think there's a concern about it, uh, just as David Falkowski was talking about in an earlier webinar in this series, to try and ensure uh, that a power of attorney or some kind of agency is set up. So the incoming assignee is effectively acting under a power of attorney but was an agent uh, for the previous holder uh, of the charge or other instrument. So that's something to bear in mind. And I want to consider for the last few minutes of this webinar, the duties owed by LPA receivers as considered in Devon commercial property against Barnett. And um, 
I think is quite an interesting one because it concerns a tripartite relationship between the receiver, the appointing mortgagee, uh, and uh, the mortgagor. And that's really touched upon. It is a tripartite relationship. Medfall from Blake uh, confirms there is a duty of good faith. But as we've already seen, uh, that is a textured one. Uh, when the receiver is there, they're exercising their powers of management to primary duty is try and bring about a situation in which the interest for secured debt can be paid and the debt itself is repaid. And subject to that primary duty, then the receiver owes the duty to manage property with due diligence. So there's going to be a conflict of interest, but as a consequence of that tripartite relationship, the rules about self-dealing and conflict of interest are very different uh, to those of the mortgagee. Uh, the mortgagee has to ensure, for example, it doesn't sell to itself. And if it sells to an associate of itself, then it's going to have to have that uh, particular duty to sell uh, for best price, reasonably practical. It's going to be scrutinized. But does that necessarily apply to the receiver standing in the middle? And we're going to look at that in the context of CIDA and uh, the decision of Devon Commercial Property against Barnett and uh, cider factories and cider bottling factories. The decision of his honour judge Paul Matthews after trial, claim brought by the mortgagees against receivers who had been appointed under the 1925 Act. So the claimant acquired a freehold of Bottling Hall in Devon, leased 70% of the property to the Devon Cider Company Limited, granted a mortgage of the freehold property to State Security Limited, but the cider company goes into administration. The administrators sell the cider business and assets to Aston Manor Brewery Company Limited, uh, who are a big cider brewery company, uh, and they granted a license to Aston Manor to use uh, the leased land. And then the mortgagee, the new mortgagee, assigns a mortgage to Aston Manor. So Aston Manor are the mortgagee. And they also have a license to use for leased land and they're running the business. So we can see immediately that the mortgagee might very well have a conflict of interest if it intends to do anything about this situation. If so claimant defaults on the interest payments under the mortgage, Aston Manor serves a default notice and appoints receivers. There's 3.4 million pounds that's secured by the mortgage. The first thing the uh, receivers do is to discuss the surrender of the lease and then grant a new lease to Aston Manor for three years. They then continue or go on to market for property. An offer comes in, but it's subject to vacant possession. Of course, they've granted a lease. They can't give vacant possession. A sale does go through, but guess what? It goes to Aston Manor Freeholds Limited, a newly formed subsidiary of Aston Manor. And because of the sale price, no surplus is returnable to the claimant. And the claimant's unhappy about this. But they say there's a duty of good faith. Uh, they say that uh, they had a duty to exercise their powers for the purpose of securing a payment of a debt, not for any other purpose, but also not to put themselves in a position of conflict or potential conflict and you to take reasonable steps to obtain the best price reasonably obtainable at the material time and to take proper steps to market the property. So the dispute faces a number of issues as to the content of the duty of receivers as well. It is not unusual for a mortgagee to be involved in a similar industry to the mortgage or, and cases I've been involved typically involve breweries and pubs. Uh, brewery companies often give out mortgages to pubs and they very much have a role to play in the industry in which the mortgage is playing. So I'd also note it's very usual, and I note at the outset, it's very usual for the LPA receivers to take advice from mortgagee's lawyers. So uh, this did raise particular practice points as well. The first question uh, for his own Judge Matthews was burden of proof. There's a sale by a mortgagee to a connected party. Uh, burdens, we've noted before, is on the mortgagee to prove a price paid the best price reasonably obtainable. Does the same apply to sales by receivers to properties associated with a mortgagee? Well, receivers appoint uh, exercising power of sale under mortgage 
owes the same equitable duty to mortgagor as owed by a mortgagee. Uh, where a receiver sells the company in which he or she has an interest. So this puts a burden on the receiver, so uh, he or she took reasonable care. Um, but the receiver and the mortgagee themselves are two separate legal persons. If they're selling to an associate of a mortgagee, the self-dealing dealing rule simply is not engaged. So in that scenario, the burden of proof is not shifted on to receiver to show that they have uh, obtained a suitable price uh, for the mortgage premises. The burden of proof still sits with the mortgage or they are simply not selling to themselves. The self-dealing rule does not apply. So again, you might very well think another example of why a mortgagee might wish to appoint a receiver. Uh, issue two, did the duty of good faith require them to exercise their powers only for the purpose of securing payment? Uh, and be for no purpose or independent conflicting interest of mortgagee and not place themselves in a position of conflict or potential conflict of interest. And I think the issue is here, what is the conflict, what is the content of any potential conflict? And it's more than, uh, a duty of good faith is more than just uh, negligence, it must involve intentional conduct and we must be looking for an element of bad faith but can fall short of dishonesty. As we've noted before, the receiver has no right to remain passive, must take steps to protect or preserve the charged property. And the receiver is not managing the property, however, for the mortgagor's benefit. Managing a property for a mortgagee's uh, security for the benefit of the mortgagee. So the mortgagee's interests and the mortgagee's interests are in conflict right from the outset. And as we've noted before, established case law, they're usually bound to prefer the interests of mortgagee. As we've noted before, mortgagee can't buy at all. An associate can only buy a safety subject to the issue as to proof. However, the receiver selling to a mortgagee's associate, there is no self-dealing. The receiver doesn't have the same interest in minimizing a price. And as long as Matthews makes a comment, the receiver's interest is in the receiver's fee. Uh, they're not going to benefit from the sale. Their benefit comes from their fee, which is going to be obtained from making an appropriate sale. The receiver simply isn't in a conflict of interest. But except, and I would go on to note, insofar as the whole rationale behind the receiver faces a receiver in, a, in the arena where uh, there are different interests and they are in conflict. It simply isn't a conflict of interest for the receiver uh, to sell to a company associated uh, with the uh, mortgagee. That is the end of today's uh, webinar, uh, where we wanted to pick up on a few points, which might be particularly appropriate when it comes to, uh, as in June 2020, some particular uh, arguments and issues that are arising, particularly when looking at appointing receivers um, and why receivers may or may not be a good idea, but also looking at potential issues as to the land registration gap at a time when the land registry is encountering some delays. This is part of a series of property webinars uh, and also construction related areas that are being given by members of 39 Essex Chambers. And also note we have a specialist uh, and distinct part of our website where we host particular articles on COVID-19 uh, related issues but as we pointed out today some of these issues aren't simply related to the current crisis uh, they are perennial ones i'd like to say thank you very much uh, for listening uh, again apologies that niraj can't be with us uh, but you can see his input on, on the slides and as discussed and i thank you all very much for attending and i wish you a, a good rest of the day thank you very much